Todd, are you actually from Minnesota? I am. I'm in Minnesota right now, as a matter of fact. A Minnesotan. <laughs> yeah, Minnesota. Yeah, sure, you betcha. Uh, Canada light. Oh, no. um, yeah, it pretty much is, eh? All right. So where would you like to start? I don't have tons of time because I need to get some fun. Boot. Um, <laughs> how, boot. how old are you? 45, you said? 45. 45 how long would you uh how long would you describe for how long would you self-describe as an anarchist well uh i can't say it's been my entire life um you know i grew up my father was very conservative he voted for bush and everything you know which bush and the first bush cool cool you know way, way back in the day and so, you know, when I first turned 18, I didn't really, you know, have my own political philosophy. I just did what my parents told me and voted for the Republican or wherever, you know. And I, I just, I never really thought about politics too much, honestly. But it seems like uh, all the politicians pretty much act the same, no matter which letter they have by their name. So it, it just seemed politics isn't the answer. And then I found philosophy and education and it seemed a, a more uh, feasible path to, to actually fixing things, you know, creating solutions in the world, you know. Money won't fix things. Politics won't fix things. we got to educate people. And that's myself included, especially myself. So I want to be the change that I want to see in the world. And I think it's a, an internal um, task. And it's more know thyself and uh, work on improving yourself, making yourself a better person. And if you build it, they will come. That's kind of, I can't say how long I've really thought this way. I guess I've always had kind of an inkling towards, you know, you know, questioning things, questioning the system, wondering what it was all about. But, uh, you know, I, 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 I have a very open mind. I'm willing to change things that, you know, we all learn, we grow. So I guess I guess the path has led me this far, and it seems like I'm on the the correct path. Um, can you tell me? The, uh, was it reading stuff that that got you into no. the, the philosophy? It was no? You picked it up just um, there's there's look I I I admit my biases um, and kaiser's in here um not in the call but kaiser's in the chat um i admit my biases i trust um the 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 anarchists i trust the most are the ones who learn it through direct action and um then come to theory um okay. they're they're the ones i trust the most about it um just because <sighs> they understand things that you can't learn you can't read about there's there's just lessons that are going to be taught that way that ultimately can't be taught any other way and so at least i can i can i can teach you i can show you what you need to read i can handhold you through theory i can do you know oh shit let's do epistemology now what is truth and what's so great about it right like i can do all that no big deal but knowing instinctually how to have your head why to have your head on that swivel and what's coming down the pike because you see the boots start to roll out, knowing in your gut what it feels like to, to be rounded up because you tried to feed a homeless person, right? Like these are, these are lessons that only get learned one way. And so those are, those are always my sort of like top tier people. Now don't get me wrong. I, you know, I've come to trust and adore and, you know, be alongside plenty of people who do, do not fit that mold, but that is my preferred form of how one comes to the anarchism. Um, and so I was surrounded by it. I grew up around it. Um, I grew up in a very anarchistic area of the country. Um, I grew up around cooperatives and mutual aid. I grew up around these sorts of things. And so, you know, and, and in the end of the day, I ended up an Occupy organizer, I ended up this, that, and the other. So, like, you know, I've got two decades of 
various degrees of organizer experience under my belt and I've got, you know, 40 years worth of just being an anarchist from birth. Um, my mom had me listening to Arlo and Woody Guthrie at like, you know, I remember age four riding in the car with her singing Alice's Restaurant, right? Guthrie. We have a Guthrie theater here in Minneapolis. I wonder if there's a relation. Um, yeah, gold, gold star anarchist, basically, wordy. Yeah. Um, and so, like, yeah, it's, you know, it, it, there's stages of, you know, punk as a, as a teenager and then IT, of course, which teaches me, you know, organizational theory and cybernetic theory and starts to teach me modalities of operation and why, uh, why uh, distributed network topologies are the most efficient uh, and resilient uh, modes of operation and organization for a structure and a superstructure and these sorts of things that sort of stack on top of my lived experience that uh, allow me to and then you know the late 20s i start like i've been doing this for as long as i had it's like oh you know what let's, let's go back circle back and do the theory like let's circle back and do the like the the classics and so that's when you start to sit down and you know read your godwin you start to read your proudhon you start to read your emma you start to read your, you know these sorts of things so you have those foundational texts so that you uh, absolutely can, you know, pass a shibboleth, um, but also that you understand where we came from. Because if you don't understand, as far as I'm concerned, if you don't understand, <laughs> Kaiser, um, more like uh, if you don't understand where you came from, then. Yeah. And you don't know where you're going? Well, it's not so much as knowing where you're going. It, that's, that's, I would consider that more of a mainstream saying because it's a very passive language right if you don't if you don't know your history you don't know where you're going sort of thing it's like no if you don't know your history then you can't forge your own future well you're doomed to repeat it as another like another you can't word. like you don't know what did work what doesn't work what's different what's the same you right? have no way to compare anything yes and so like functionally I consider it very important for an organizer, at least. Like, if you just want to, if you just want to be a food not bomb street level uh, activist as an anarchist, I got no compunction about like that. That that shibboleth for me is an entirely different thing. That's that's like, tell me about your sandwich making, right? It's you know, it's, my, it's like you know, that. My, but if you want to organize, I'm gonna ask you some questions. Right. Yeah, a lot of my friends, like, you know, they're not into politics, they're into music and stuff, but just trying to get people uh, coordinated and um, it's like trying to organize a marriage between four people to all show up for band practice and um, to rehearse and all that. So, I mean, I understand the concept, but I don't know if everyone has like the, the social skills, maybe necessarily, even if they have the, the intellectual knowledge and to... to to that, bring people together, you know? Well, but that, that is, so one of the common well, things that we talk about that we have to deal with on the left is the modern era of the woke scoldy type. Um, and so like, I, I will say things along the lines of if you can't handle being like surrounded by rough language and slurs, then you probably shouldn't be organizing at the docks, right? Like there are places sure. where you do not belong. I'm not saying get out. I'm not saying you don't belong. I'm saying that if you can't cook, we're going to need you to at least learn how to cook before we put you in a kitchen, like as we put you in the kitchen, right? Like there's, no, there's skills and capacity and the emotional labor and the intellectual labor that are required for f some tasks. And ultimately being an organizer, being able to like gather people and put them onto a focus without being hyper coercive, exploitative, or commanding about it is a skill set unto itself. And if you don't possess that skill set, if you haven't practiced that skill set, if you've never demonstrated that skill set, right? If you don't have the underpinnings for it, the sort Your of ability thing, to influence people. Yeah. Like if you don't have that stuff, then it's just sort of not the role for you sort of situation, or at least not now, right? Not yet, right? It's definitely things that can be practiced and learned and grown and into. You're born 
but too like you know if you have good looks for example you know it might be easier to... it, i mean pretty privileged does exist there's no getting around you're, that you're wearing it, a nice suit you know instead of just I, shabby clothes well see that's the thing back. is do, in in my circles if you show up wearing a nice suit you will be counterproductive <laughs> exactly um you are wearing the uniform of the oppressor nobody i know wears a suit so it's like in your neck of the woods, I will be judged by my boots and whether they're brand new or not, or whether they've got some wear and tear on them and what yep. kind of, see, like it is about that sort of like, you have to be able to know how to be read and read. And so, yeah, I mean, that, that makes sense to me. And I so, get that. Yeah. No argument. And so, like, that's ultimately uh, my, what would be my question to you is, where do you see yourself going? You want to be the change that you see in the world. Well, what, what is the change you want to see in this world? Well, obviously, I'd like people to work together, and I'd like to be part of whatever change there is, even if I'm not necessarily the one um, fomenting it. Um, I just... Uh, I think that there's a lot of good ideas out there. There's a lot of good leaders. I think we could all be leaders in a way. Not all, uh, we're not all capable in every aspect of leadership. Um, I'm not trying to rant how, on here. How big oh. is the town or city you find yourself in? So I visit Minneapolis pretty, pretty often. Actually, I got some, uh, I do house cleaning and stuff for some people. And I got some clients in Minneapolis that I work for. Um, I live right now in Ham Lake, Minnesota. It's like 20 minutes from northeast Minneapolis, maybe 25 minutes. Um, it's a pretty good sized community. I mean, okay, so you okay, so for for like okay, so you got a workable number here actually. Yeah. Um, so you got about fifteen thousand two hundred people, which is a. Okay is is a drop in the bucket compared to what some of us have to do. <laughs> um i immediately pulled the, nice. the the census data for the location um because that's <clears throat> that's the first thing i wanted to know was the census data um and so the next thing i want to know is Okay, so median family income was 67, I'm sorry, household was 67, family was 71. So not poor, <clears throat> it's not a terribly poor location, and it's got a workable number. Yeah. Um, and it seems to be pretty much 94.4% white, cool. Um, so how, um, how, like, to what degree is this location that you find yourself residing in? It is a suburb. Okay. So you find your, it is a suburb. Yeah. Um, okay. Suburbs are difficult um, for organizing. So suburbs are a nightmare for organizers, frankly. Um, it's filled with people who are um, basically the definition of comfortable. And so they, you know, they're, they're usually content with the status quo. And yeah. So, they don't have a fire lit up under their ass. Yet. Yes. And so when you're talking about disrupting the status quo, all they hear about, all they hear is, you know, rabble rouser, troublemaker. You're trying to fuck up my life. They're hopelessly dependent on the system. Like Morpheus says in the matrix. So ultimately though, given that it is Minnesota, <clears throat> You have one leg up on that, at least. Um, it is an area that is intimately familiar with the concept of like hunting and like we're, like having a cabin up north and that sort of like mentality, the sort of rural-ish, rural adjacent mentality. Kind of or outdoors mini. Kind yes. Of red, maybe even. And so... Uh, what you have in that leg ups, uh, leg up, um, is ultimately you can start constructing dual power structures functionally fairly easily with these people. Now, what do I mean by dual power structures? I mean things that replace the structure of a primary system. So, um, community gardens can replace a grocery store. So taking away that capitalist and statist modality of operation 
Um, and so, uh, hey, Aaron, go fuck yourself. Um, <clears throat> that's your first warning, Aaron. Um, so taking away that status and capitalist modality of operation, um, is, uh, the, your, like your primary drive, right? You're looking to f- like, uh, uh, undermine that methodology. And so something like a, a community garden is a great place to start, right? Or a like, and so the community garden feeds into a food bank because if you produce surplus, then you have for the lean times and you store that for the lean times. And then that f- the community garden can feed into a soup kitchen. That soup kitchen can feed into, so see what I'm uh, saying in that regard. Yeah. And so you can also do a free library. You could, if you have a glut of, say you have a bunch of medical professionals in your, in your suburb, you find out you like, do we got a lot of doctors and nurses for some reason, right? Like, or just nurses, right? You can free clinic territory, right? That's sort of, you sit back as an organizer and you analyze, you go, what do we have in spades, right? What do we have? And you take advantage of that and use that excess, that surplus, and siphon off the amount of labor that you can. And food is a great place to start. Anarchists feed people. It's one of the primary things anarchists do is feed people. Um, It's a primary motivating factor in all of humanity. Sure. And people in Minnesota are familiar with growing and hunting food. Yeah. Agriculture. Yep. Yep. And so, like, ultimately, if you created a food surplus for your community, and it's not just about, like, it's about destigmatizing as well. And so in that suburb, many of them will be struggling with food costs, with the rising food costs, and they won't want, they will want to keep up appearances. And so it's about moderating and managing those appearances as well as a good propagandist. Because ultimately, part of your job as that organizer is going to be propagandist. And so what you have to do is manage their expectations and their sort of preconceptions. And rather than presenting it in the light of a community garden and soup kitchen that they would normally think of, what you can do is come out right out of the gate and say, why are we reliant upon these industrial food systems that every year we have spinach that kills people? Every year we have to see these corporate owned, uh, corporate owned grocery stores and these big agri farms charge us more and more for, uh, for a product that we know is grown using horrible practices. Why don't we get together as a community and provide our own clean, homegrown, organic produce? And we could do it for less, uh, for, uh, for less cost than it actually costs us at the store. And hey, three years on, we've been doing this community garden program and it's so successful and we have so much excess we're setting up a small cafe and the local uh the lo- some of the, we're going to hire some of the local high schoolers and we're going to get some uh you know we're we're going to employ some people we're going to do a local cafe and we're going to have low cost food that our community grew ourselves available to the community <clears throat> because we want to be self sufficient and resilient as a community right that, that makes- that sells a lot differently than the the community soup kitchen and community garden, right? Well, yeah, I mean, it's it gives you a, a kind of a you know, I don't want to say a light at the end of the tunnel, but kind of along those same lines, it, it, it gives you a, a goal to work towards, not just like, well, this would be a great idea, but we're actually building something here. Is that kind of like what you're? Yeah, and I mean, and what you're. <clears throat> and then as an anarchist, what you do is you manage the, in- the implementation of those systems. That way it doesn't become some hierarchical garbage. You set it up as a publicly, a community owned cooper- cooperative right out of the gate. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it definitely would take some research to... Aaron, the the actual mechanics of that, but I I get the idea of 
once you once you get the people together and stuff but then it's just a matter of pooling resources and actually um getting people to, uh, take time out of their day to to do the physical work to actually build it and i mean managing that becomes a job aaron the anarchist uh, the anarchistic republic of Kospia lasted for 375 years there you go uh, lasted long, uh, longer, and uh, was uh, uh, lasted longer, and was economic so economically successful that um, the Catholic Church actually went to war with it. There you go. So, I don't know what Kospai uh, is. Is anyway, that something from as somebody? Somebody in chat, uh, just somebody being a fucking little edgy, edgy boy trying to fucking do some okay. things. Um, <laughs> don't even worry about it. Um, so sure. yeah, well, that relief there that then becomes your task um, as as the organizer to figure that out. That's where your labor goes in large part is finding the people, motivating the people, and figuring out that you got to figure out those motivations. You got to figure out a lot of stuff, man. That's a lot of work. It's a lot of work, but that's on you. You follow me. Yeah, let's get started. But I mean, step one. <laughs> I, I just wish it was like it, there's. Uh, it's, I mean, every if you sit. I mean, obviously, if you start doing something, you'll figure it out along the way. But yeah, and I mean, um, um, oh, Aaron, is why am I insulting you? A little uncalled for, but whatever. Oh, the dude who came in trying to get me to say the the n word. With his first question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I can't imagine why I called you a little edgy, edgy boy. Um, so, hmm, I wonder. Hmm. So anyway, back to people who are more important than whatever that person is. Um, have you, uh, have you ever read rules for radicals? Uh, I've heard the book and I know I think it's Saul Linsky or something. Yes. Um, if you fancy yourself a community organizer, you're going to need to read that book. Is it available? Uh, uh, if it, are you, it is wide, widely available. Um, are you an audio book or a, a textual book kind of guy? More textual because I find when I'm listening to audio stuff, I kind of like drift off and daydream and I forget what, what I'm doing and where I'm at. But if I'm reading, I tend to pay attention more and focus and then I'm not distracted by because when I'm listening to something, I don't just close my eyes and listen. I'll do something else, and I'll be doing some chores or something, and I'll forget about what I was listening to. <laughs> um, yep, no worries. Um, we will we will get you a copy. <clears throat> um, somebody want to work on that PDF, please, and thank you. Um, uh, we will get that sent over. Um, uh, rules for radicals, Wordy. <clears throat> um, yeah, so functionally, Alinsky wrote um, the sort of the the seminal text on this matter. It doesn't really matter your political alignment, but if you're gonna if you're going to be a community organizer, there's some foundational lessons, and it's not a huge book. Um, okay, thank you for twos. Um, <clears throat> there's a link in chat right now. Um, and I will, you know what, I'll just DM it to you. Is it like a guide or just give you like, like oh. kind of like step by step, step kind of wrong, just... link, wrong link entirely. Hold on. Mm -hmm. There you go. Um, <clears throat> there you go. All right. Clicking. Um, it is, it is part autobiographical. Um, but given that this is a man who like city councils made it, like they literally made it illegal for him to come into his town. Like this dude was, he was feared. He was a very feared organizer. This is a guy that the Catholic church turned to, to train Catholic priests uh, as community organizers. This 1969. Is, yeah. This is, this is a guy who brought major multinational corporations to heal just by showing up in town. All right. This 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 is this is a man who was very very effective at what he did, um, and so it, it best to hear him out. There are there's a list of rules and there's a reason to to know those rules, but there's a reason to read the rest of it as well, so you understand how and why and how it was used and that sort of thing. 
Um, <clears throat> and yes, there's a link in chat right now uh, for a YouTube link of a dude who does a pretty cool reading of it as well. So if you'd like, if you want to hear it and follow along in text, feel free. Um, so, yes. All right. Um, that's that's a good place to start. Um, I'm scrolling over ahead. I'm scrolling over it right now. 184 pages. It looks yeah, it's, like or it's not bad. Is the last uh, what do you call it? Chapter. So yeah, looks pretty interesting. Yeah, that's that's a good place to start. Just as an organizer. Because you're going to need to understand some of working with people's sort of situation. Um, but then as an anarchist, it's best to, I mean, there's a lot of theory to be read up on to sort of know, know what not to do is probably the way I'd go. Um because there's a lot of pitfalls that you can end up in um, as an organizer that ultimately you, you start creating hierarchies of power that cannot be put in check once they are implemented. And because it's just human tendency. And so you, it, it just makes, it's easier. It's easier. Sometimes it's easier. Right. And we, we have that, te those tendencies as humans. And so there's a lot of that sort of thing that, um, is spread across a lot of theory. Um, and so like I would, we do have a reading list you could choose from at, at foot. There's a lot of, there's a lot of pages you could read. There's a lot mm -hmm. of pages you could read, but your heart's in the right place. And Thanks. it's just so you just need to find a direction and go yeah, that like, direction. Like you were saying before, I don't mean to cut you off again. Um, yeah. Like I'm a very misunderstood person. Like it's it's refreshing to to know that people can actually take me seriously. But usually, I just try to talk to people, and you know, oh, you're a, a, a chud, or you're a capitalist, or you're this. And it's like, wait a minute, I'm not any of those things. Like, what's going on here? But I mean. It, it, it's easy to, you know, I have a hard time like expressing my my true thoughts with people because it seems like they don't understand what I'm talking about, or maybe I'm just not saying it the right way. <laughs> you will always be approached with suspicion in leftist spaces because the we have to be a self insulating group due to a number of factors. Um, but outside of that you're never going to be understood because you're speaking about something that runs against the status quo itself. And not just against the status quo, but against people's lived experiences. And so when you speak to them, you're not going to be able to speak to them like an anarchist. So to me, you there's it's called code switching, all right? And you have to get good at it. This is, this is just one of those get good sort of things, right? Um, to speak to leftists, to speak to anarchists specifically, you have to speak our language to a certain extent. There will be a shibboleth. There will be a test to be able to cross the threshold, as it were. But then to the people you are attempting to organize who are not anarchists by any means— I, I don't think for a second that Ham Lake, Minnesota probably has a very large anarchistic contingent in it. Um, probably not. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's you and an, one other dude, right? Um, so Yeah. Well, I got to find them. But it, you, it, it, if you do, hang on desperately. But at the end of the day, it's about speaking their language. And that's sort of that rebranding, that propagandization I did with like a community garden and a soup kitchen. Rebrand that, right? Talk to them in the way that you know they're receptive, right? It's, it's about if you speak to them, ask them questions, ask them what their concerns are in this world, ask them, you know, hey, have you noticed food's been getting more expensive? Oh man, our food bill this last year has been ridiculous. 
I know. And I just heard a story the other day. Did you see that the spinach killed another person? It's, it, this is this is terrible. This, these big farms are out of control, and we have like. What happened to the world our grandparents lived in where we put food away during, you know, so we had some for the lean months during the winter. What happened to that mentality? I think it was like, what? I don't remember the exact figure, but I remember it was either 10% or 30% of Americans originally were their own farmers. And now it's like less than 1% and everyone buys from the big farms. They don't do their own yeah. food production. And anymore. because it's because we're busy, right? Because yeah, we're making money for the man, right? And so what we have to do is use a division of labor, right? We can't all tend the farm all the time anymore. But you know what? In this cul-de-sac, in this little community right here, you know, there's six people with property abutting each other. And if we just put those properties together and then took turns, maybe an hour or two a week per, per family, we could, you, we could probably grow enough food to at least feed us, during, feed us our produce during the summer. And I bet, you know, how much do you spend on your, on your produce bill during the summer? That sort of thing. See, where, see my direction. Absolutely. Uh, I just think it'd be easier, like... If you like knew a guy who owns six houses and then is like, you guys all move in as opposed to like trying to convince five other neighbors. It will, like, there will always be another easier route that you will envy, sure. but that won't be your lot in life. <clears throat> That's you're right about that. your, as an organizer, you don't get to pick the people you organize basically. It's, it's very much like you, the, the flock that needs you is the flock that you get. You don't get to pick, especially as an anarchistic or as an anarchistic organizer, you deal with mm -hmm. broke people, you deal with broken people, you deal with people who are trapped in the system. You don't get some based like galaxy brained millionaire. That's not who you get. Right. You you get a you get a single mother of three who's scraping by trying to make this shit work. Right? That's I'm, that's your team. Right. I'm just thinking like, you know, with the way you describe it, I mean I know it, it's just like an example, like six people next to each other in a cul de sac. But with the other example you give, like the the, the struggling mother, maybe she's like across town or something and like Organizing a community garden might be a little different because I'd have to like drive 45 minutes in between our spot and she'd have to drive 45 minutes in between. So well, I mean, obviously but, location is, is kind of an important factor, like getting your neighbors together. You well, know? but that's you is, neighbors, as but. crazy as it sounds, you start with the ones who can start, right? You don't, that single mother who's 45 minutes away can be the beneficiary of what you set up eventually but she may not be able to be the beneficiary of it immediately. That's just the reality of the situation. The hardest part of what you are going to have to do is the pragmatic realist part, which I'm lucky. I'm good at it due to my mom being a lifelong nurse. I'm good at compartmentalization. Mm -hmm. But the worst part of what you're going to have to do is accept the horror yeah that's i don't know except the horror like i mean obviously you gotta have one foot on the ground one head in the clouds you gotta be in this world but not of it like because we all we're, we're all stuck in this mess and we don't like it we have but we have to deal with it it's our responsibility to get our asses out of it you so you, i don't like the idea of of uh I don't even remember. You have to, you have to be able to be realistic in your expectations. Oh yeah, that, that's a better way of putting it. Yeah, because if you are not, <clears throat> you are foregoing any potential good that you could do. Setting yourself up for failure, basically. Because don't let yeah. don't let the perfect be the enemy of good.
right? To be perfect is, is if you first you don't succeed, try and try again. Perfect to me is is uh, an aspiration. It's it's, it's a, more it's of a, a direction. Yeah, a direction, not a destination. Exactly. Um, but this is this is you just need to start somewhere, and it could start anywhere. It's it's about a you need to talk to your people. You need to one find your people. You need to two talk to your people, and then three you need to make a realistic assessment of where you can start, what you can do. Sure, and yeah, you know, it's things obviously Rome wasn't built in a day, but just working on the the whole social interaction thing is is going to be because sure I got to find people to talk to, but first I have to find people to um, associate with in the first place. You know, maybe. Uh, I'd have to, you know, get a membership at a gym or something, you know, and find some people there. But, you know, obviously just sitting at home, talking to people online, I'm not going to meet a whole lot of people in my specific geographic location. I'm going to have to do some footwork, so to speak. But again, I don't really, you know. You you live in. They, they play music, you know. Hey, maybe it starts at the bar. Maybe. You know, a place that music gets played? I do bartending too, so I mean. There you, maybe. there, you, oh my God. Okay, no, hold on. I already know where, dude, you bartend? Yeah. Okay. Do your, do your, do your people ever, do you ever talk to people across the bar? Usually it's about whatever they want to talk to because uh, I dude, found like tips that if they want to talk about sports, I talk about Steer sports. that conversation. Get yeah. get good at steering the conversation. Okay. Even even sports. All right. So oh yeah, fucking your team. Yeah, and they lost to that bigger team. Yeah, it's because that other team bought that that, that team that team bought their team, my dude. They spent more money. Like it's this sport has become nothing more than a business anyway. I mean, look at look at the world. It's how everything else is. I mean, these guys are getting paid a hundred million dollars, and the fact of the matter is, it's like, dude, you can steer that conversation. Yeah, that's true. Everything is politics. Politics is everything. Reminds me of that. I don't remember what the movie is, but uh, some guy is asking him someone a question, and he's like, "You have my." attention and then he keeps talking he's like well now you have my interest so but yeah i mean yeah, definitely that i'll have to work on is the more social skills i mean i i, I have a good idea of right versus wrong it's just mo most people don't want to talk about philosophy and morals things like that you know they want to talk about sports and things but you know but yeah, again, as as, as for two's put it I, I i'll translate it to the midwest isn't it fucked that our tax dollars go to build these billion dollar stadiums when people are starving? It is fucked. Right? It is fucked. Right. Well, that's you know, fucked. It's like we don't get we don't see nothing. It's all the the, the owner of the stadium, he didn't have to pay anything or whatever. Mm -hmm. He just gets to keep it all. And yep. we paid for it. Yep. It, it don't make no fucking sense. There is there is no way to not steer every single conversation to one of these talking points. This is, this is, this is a skill set that you have to work on. And that ultimately over, like I said, I did, I, I did speech. I, I did theater. I did repertory, touring repertory company. I did mock trial. I did speech and debate. I did constitutional issues. I did a whole bunch of stuff that trained me for standing up in front of a bunch of people and speaking on a point and hammering that point if I have to, or getting pretty okay. slick about it. But also you have to practice it in front of real people, not just a classroom. And so it takes time. But being a bartender is possibly one of the greatest locations to practice this skill set because your clientele is already a little tipsy. And if you fuck up, they probably won't remember. Right. And I mean, they're really chatty too. So I'm constantly talking with people. I mean, that you got to work the tip, so to speak. You know, you, not just because you want to make money, but I, I mean, I generally, I like uh, customer service, you know, making people feel like they're accommodated um, and just, Yep. Life should be a big party, you know. I mean, obviously there's rules with parties. People still got to clean up and stuff, but like that's ultimately, you know, 
Yeah. No, what do you, you want to be in life? I want to be happy. You well, are, you you are like positioned life. uniquely. You, you, you've, you've got what you need, my dude. Um, I, I, think, I think a little bit of theory could, could aid you. Um, just so you know where this stuff comes from. Sure, I'm open to all constructive criticism. You know, um, I know. that you you to be able to forge your own direction, to be able to take from because there's a giant pile of ideas sitting out there that you can Absolutely. you can pick and choose from. Right. I like I like to think of myself as a reasonable person. Not, you know, I, I I don't like to you know call myself like the smartest person in the world, but I like to think I, I'm at least reason. Like I can figure out, you know, right from wrong and common sense, you know, and most people can reason, but a lot of people, it seems that they're not honest with themselves. And you ask them a question, um, you know, like Socrates did people, he would ask people to, you know, answer what they thought they already knew. And when they, they couldn't answer them, it was embarrassing for them. So they didn't like Socrates very um, much. There is a link in chat. Um, Let's see. Um, the reading list. And Kazthings.com. Yeah. Um there you can start there, sort of territory. Um <clears throat> I would if you if you want the sort of like the baby anarchist, um Ruth Kinna, K I N N A. It's here. I will put show it on stream. Here's the book. It's the government of no one, the theory and practice of anarchism. It goes through sort of some of the history, some of the people, some of the like various thoroughfares of thought, and she'll put it into the right sort of order and context for you. So you got a bunch of uh, tabs on there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You agree. That must be one that you use a lot. Um, a once upon a time. Yeah. Um, it, um, but I mean, Ultimately, for me, a lot of my stuff actually comes from Bellamare, at least for modern organizational um, methodologies in combination with Alinsky actually uh, become uh, comes from Bellamare for me. But um, if you want to know like about all of it, Demanding the Impossible by Peter Marshall, it'll be on that list as well. Um, it's 880 pages of mostly eurocentric because if you do uh, if you start to stray into south america and then asia and africa um very quickly the 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 page counts gets up to you know 2500 sort of territory um but the last one the activist dao de cheng oh uh yes uh i, I like have oh was is this related to like yeah, um, I can try and find it pretty quickly for you if you want well, an example. Well, I got the, here's it's, the link right here. It um, is uh, well, I mean, I have I have all of these, um, but like um, it is it is written by a Western um, uh, turned Taoist who is also a life a, a multi decade uh, activist. <clears throat> and he sort of tries to relate or um connect the lessons of the Tao Te Ching to the methodologies of activism. And so it is, if you, if you, ha if you have a predilection for Taoism, it will probably speak to you to some extent. All right. Oh, well, that's a very, yeah, I was just scrolling through the, the different titles there and that one at the very end that, that definitely popped out. I might even have to start at the last one, work my way up. Um, yeah, if you want to know more uh, about anarchism, go with the government of no one. It's a good way, a good way to start. Ruth, Ruth Kenna will teach you a good amount in the context that you should know it. Um, and so, and it's, it's shorter than, you know, most tomes on the matter would be, um, yeah, but, uh, rules for radicals for being an organizer, government of no one sort of getting your feet wet as far as like the the history 
both, you know, um, sort of 1800s onward, but also up to fairly recent endeavors um, as far as like intersectionality and that sort of thing. Um, it doesn't come into the sort of post uh, era where you have uh, like you know the, the modern actors um, influencing, where you have like Jason and Bob and those sorts of guys. Um, Were there books and stuff from, from pre uh, 1800s or was that when the concept? Well, it, it's OK. So that's how, that's where we sort of start to divide from anarchism and, anar and anarchy into two camps, because um, okay. anarchy has always been with us. It, it okay. likely predates humanity as a species, but it's right. it, it kind of has the notion that we're all born as anarchists. That's why I mentioned that earlier. That is that is a post anarchist uh, philosophy, actually. Um, that files that files firmly under what's called post anarchism. Um, mm -hmm. But there, um, it is firmly like considered indigenous tech or indigenous technology. Um, as far as like anarchy goes, like, uh, you know, sort of distributed topologies of organizational tribalistic methodologies of operating non hierarchical systems, these sorts of things predate us and go, go into indigenous areas as well. Um, but then you have this sort of formalized, uh, scientized, uh, it, the, the, the full study of right? The philosophy post-enlightenment, po post-Renaissance, post-enlightenment, sort of study, formalized study of, and that like, becomes, like, an it. yes, and that becomes anarchism. And, you know, capital A anarchism, right? And that's where you start to have, like, you know, the sort of foundational will be Godwin, um, who, and, and is sort of the, the first anarchist, right? In the sort of Ne a neoclassical sense, right? Um, and then you start to have like you know, it's it's Proudhon after that found uh, founding mutualism. Um, Godwin oftentimes is claimed by individualists as well as sort of a foundational individualist. Well, what I, this mutualism term is kind of new to me. Like, what's the difference? Like, what can you compare? Give me like a, a synopsis or like a comparison of what it would be. Like the differences between mutualism and individualism, so to speak. Uh, yeah, it's about the prioritization of the uh, group or the individual. It's well, co collective ownership ver uh, versus potentially individualized ownership. Because for me, like an entity, an individual can be an entity, but uh, a group would be like a fictional entity, you know, just like a concept, not an actual. Well, that's that's where you start to you want to go. That's where you end up in philosophy, and it, the individual right. is also a construct. I have a philosophical quandary with my my issue with the group is like let's say you got two people in a car and one steering wheel, but one person wants to turn it left and one person wants to turn it right. I mean, if both people wanted to turn it the same way then it wouldn't really be the group doing the thinking. It'd be each person. You know, it almost like you have to have a consensus for a group, but then once it's a group, so, once, it's a, once it's a consensus, then it's one, one entity and not, you know, so like, I'm just try, trying to figure out the mechanics of you're, like how you would organize the group as one. Okay. One anarchists engage in con what's called consensus decision-making. Um, and so you, 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 he's getting there. Um, but two, you can absolutely, <clears throat> uh, engage in a, uh, delegative process so that the group in the car is fine with the, the driver turning left. Right. Oh, yeah. But if the group decides that they are no longer okay with the driver, and the driver's decisions, then they can, they can trade out or change directions or change this process fundamentally, right? They can, they have the right to alter this arrangement at any time. Yeah. This alter can consist of many different options. So, but I think you're adding an unnecessary complication to your own intellectual processes by by unifying the group into a single macro entity um, 
not because it doesn't operate that way oftentimes, but I think it's complicating your thought process about these fundamental terms. Because you 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 get lost on the group in like mutualist is is a sort of collective uh, operational well, the, the mode. Concept, whereas, the concept seems clear. It's the mechanics that are just a bit foggy for me. Well, but I mean, there's okay. So consensus decision making would be a group of people decide on a task that need be done. Then they engage in hearty debate, discussion, conversation about the direction and tasks that there are in, that need to be engaged in whatever direction they're choosing to go with this collective action. The uh, any single individual within that collective group has the right of uh, veto that they can say, I do not wish to participate in this. And you can cycle that back to the origination starting point and address their concerns. And so you can engage in a collective decision-making process in which the rights of every individual are respected, yet the needs and wants of the group are addressed and met. I guess a, a phrase comes to mind that might crystallize my argument more. And it, that is to say, you can please some of the people all the time. You can please all, all the people some of the time, uh, but you can't please all the people all the time. And so that's, 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 that, that's the hang up I have with the group is that you can please all the people some of the time, some of the people all the time, but you can't please all the people all the time. So you'd almost have to have separate groups because there's to, to get everyone in the world to agree on one thing. But we're not talking, um, see, that's, that's the, that's the thing is okay. okay so you are you are so not there nobody's there all right? right you are worrying about a scope and scale that is so beyond what you need to be worried about sure you need to be worried about four dudes handing out sandwiches well that's a lot easier yeah okay but that's the thing are you going to be organizing a, the replacement for a nation state in your lifetime we both know the answer to that question. Okay, it, it, probably not, right? Well, probably not. We'll put a little money down, but the odds are on probably not, right? Me as well, I as well, right? I'm, I'm not a gambling man generally, but uh, that's a pretty safe bet. Right? Like, so So, why are you concerning yourself with that? Well, again, I want to, as you grow in scale, you have to know where, where it's leading to. So, why, you know... At most, at Maybe most, at scale, it might, the the uh, dynamics of it might change. At, might have to it, alter abso my... it absolutely will. Um, but right now, all you need to consider your all you need to concern yourself with is Dunbar's number. Dunbar's number. Is that the four people making a sandwich? It is the maximum number that a social group can maintain cohesion with. It's placed generally at two hundred and fifty people. So it can vary a little bit. Oh, on absolutely. It can shift. Right. But it's basically the amount of connections a human brain can make. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's its capacity. It's, it's basically, it's limiting capacity. Rainy, I've seen it as low as a buck 20. I've seen it as high as 250. It's fucking, depending on the organizational <laughs> structure, it can go into the thousands. But yeah, it ultimately, yeah. So it's it's about those connections that they can maintain. That's that's where you need to concern yourself right now because ultimately, once I hit that number, then we just start a new one, right? And then connect them together afterwards. You see, but you can't like what you're saying is you can't grow it any higher than that as one group, right? Well, it's doable, but it's do you have to do it and you have to take other things into account. And so what you're dealing with as an anarchist is what we refer we affectionately refer to as affinity groups. I'm just trying to figure out is it is the concept more like from one many or is it from many one? Do you see where I'm going it is, with that? It is both and neither. Okay. Um, anarchists, an, anarchists have the leg up on the communists as far as ethics go. Yes. Insofar as that we recognize that the good of the the communal uh, the good of the communal group is met through the empowerment of the individual 
Very good. That it is about a balancing of those mutualist and individualist necessities and wants. I'm still with you. We're on the same page. So if you just hold that in mind the whole way through, then you start to develop the affinity groups. Now, maybe that affinity group is the people who are food, sorry, food insecure, right? They're concerned about food, right? Food's expensive and we need to, okay, cool. But this group over here isn't so concerned about uh, food security, but you know what they are concerned about? They're concerned about losing their jobs, all right, well, that's your unionization group. That's your workplace democratization group. And then there's overlap because what happens if you lose your job? Well, you're going to be food insecure. So why don't you support this group that is concerned about food insecurity and the food insecurity crew? Look, they can help you if you assist them, right? So it's about understanding the affinities of your affinity groups and seeing where the, I'm going to use a fancy term here, where the, uh-huh. where the vesica Pisces lies. So oh in a Venn diagram, that portion that overlaps in the center is called the vesica Pisces, right? So it's about finding the overlap between your affinity groups that you have organized and seeing how they can synergize with one another at that point. They don't have to be the same organizational group, but they have to recognize, respect, and aid each other when, it, when push comes to shove. Well, it's starting to make sense. I mean, because... Uh... Just that, that whole number you put out with the limiting capacity of the brain. Because that was like my main concern. Because you were like, you know, start on something smaller with four sandwiches. And, you know, and I was thinking more like, uh, you know, nation building or something. But it wasn't necessarily that I wanted to start there. I was just more or less wondering what we do when we get to that. How do we go from the, the macro to the micro or the micro to the macro? And that seems like a, a pretty good explanation where you're overlapping the different communities and it's in that that small region where they overlap that you can the synergy yeah one plus one equals three i get it like two uh energies are all putting more energy than the two totals combined and so i i i can see the potential for growth there the way you you explained it when so that makes more when sense. when you fuck with one uh one trade union in in certain parts of the world Spain is a good example. You fuck with a t- one trade union, you have brought hell down upon your head because every other trade union will refuse to do business. They will refuse to move your product. They will refuse to service your machinery. They will refuse to deliver your goods. They will refuse to turn on your electricity because they all know what's good for one of them is good for all of them. And what hurts one of them hurts all of them. Yeah, and I mean, it's not just the unions. I mean, it's uh, not the best circumstances, but it happened to me. Uh, I, I took a trip to Br- Brazil, and I, I before I went, I put my uh, my rent money in the, in the bank, $800. And right when I was doing it, their computer shut down. And so she's like, oh, I'll just go over to this next terminal over here. And then she did the deposit there. Well, when everything got booted back up, I guess the, the first one it went through, and so I got a double deposit, 800 twice. Well, I recognized that right away, and I called the bank and said, look, this is what happened, and you guys got to fix it. And I said, well, there's no way we can track the money, and, you know, there's nothing you can do. I was like, well, should, what should I do? Well, just call us back tomorrow. Or, you know, I, I called them for, like, three weeks in a row, and they eventually they told me to ask them, can I spend the money? And they're like, yeah, just go ahead and spend it. So I only spent $400 out of it. And uh, <laughs> at the end of the month, they had done some kind of more thorough audit, and they had eventually, even though I told them, I guess they had found their mistake. Well, they instantly withdrew the $800 out, but since I only had $400 in there, it made me negative $400. And then there's like an algorithm on their computer where it automatically shuts your account down if you're below a certain amount if you're overdrawn a certain amount and i tried to explain them what would happen 
what happened, but the manager couldn't even unlock my account. So I think it was like for two years or four years. I can't remember which one it was. I wasn't able to open a bank account at any bank. This happened at Wells Fargo. I couldn't go to U.S. Bank. I couldn't go to... Because, um, because <clears throat> the capital class has solidarity. But it was their mistake, which is the, the worst matter. part about it. The, the capital class, the ruling class has class solidarity. They I always have. have. I could tell you a thousand stories like that. I moved out of an apartment. I had them come in, do a check before I left. Everything was golden. And then they uh, put on my credit report that I didn't pay my last rent. And then they didn't give me my deposit back. And so I had to go to the bank and pay like $45 to get the copies of the checks with their endorsement on the back, proving that they cashed it. And I even said that sent it to the credit union to get them to take my the, the negative thing off my credit. And they wouldn't. They said all they did was put the customer disputes yeah it or whatever but it's, it's like no trial no no conviction and all of a sudden i'm guilty until proven innocent and it, it just seems like but that's that's your I'm, job now as a bartender that's what worries me is what i'm trying to say is that much power concentrated into small hands could be used for nefarious purposes because there should be some kind of arbitrary part arbitration process where i can go and say look this is what really happened and they could say okay well we'll clear yeah, this that's not going to happen well, not oh. until the uh, until there is class solidarity amongst their depositors. Well, they're profit, they're profit driven, so they're worried about what their shareholders if, think. Rather, if than everybody, them. if if everybody in that bank heard one story about that happening and said, "If this is not rectified, we're all removing our money," with right. the actual threat of removal of money causing a bank run, they would fix yeah. it. Yeah, but absolutely. there is no class solidarity. Later, Deirdre. Um, oh, hey, sorry, not later, but hey there, Deirdre. Um, you know, like the average person like tried to start a boycott. Not many people would listen to him, but like some huge celebrity, if they went out on TV and said, we're boycotting this, like look what Kid Rock did to Bud Light. I mean, yeah, yeah um, that's a lot of influence. I'm not saying, you know, it's good or bad. I'm just saying, look at what influence can do. So... It is your job now, or at least it is your self-appointed job, to start practicing this skill set. You're right. At your job, which is the perfect training ground for it. It's the perfect training ground for it, Thank of you. guiding these conversations into anti-authoritarian, anti-capitalist, pro-distributed uh, pro network sort of thinking. That like, oh, you know, it doesn't matter what they come up with. It's your job now to visualize that through line and get them there. You have an end goal that you, you, have, a, you, have, a, you have a zone of touchdown that you want to hit every single time with every single conversation. It is your job to six degrees of Kevin Bacon that conversation into, hey, do you know you're getting fucked? everyone likes kevin bacon right that's your job now is to figure out every single time that you are you it's like it doesn't matter what they sit down and say your job is to figure out how do i get and without fucking railroading it without it seeing make it natural and you have to yeah. figure out i gotta go from a to b to c to d to e to f Right. Well, I think one of the ways I could do that since I make music and I work, I've been trying to get, <laughs> it's kind of hard to get into some of these places because they're I've got contracts with the, the two industry uh, music pimps, I call them, uh, Absy Entertainment and Rogers Industries, I think. But uh, yeah, if I put like lyrics into a song, you know, because music's a great communicator, I think that would be a great way without me having to like sit down and talk to a bunch of people for me to naturally just and people would listen because they'd think it's music, but then I'd be like in putting those seeds in their head. And maybe after the show, people could talk to me more and stuff. You know, I was thinking maybe that'd be a good way to like launch things, you know, it but depends. It's I mean, there's a lot of different ideas. I don't have to stick with one thing, but yep. I'd like maybe. All right. I have been going for f over five hours now, so I am going to call this here. Um, All right. Well, thanks for having me on, man. 
You're welcome. Thanks for being a pleasant conversation. And um, appreciate it. Yeah. Um, like I said, uh, if you want to organize rules for radicals, if you want to understand anarchism a little bit better, government of no one. And if you do have a propensity for Taoism, um, there is that book as well. Very good. Well, I'll check them out. Definitely check them out. All right. Um, yeah. Um, I'm on five days a week ish. Um, just I have health issues, so I call off. But you're on Discord. You'll see the notification if you want it. So. Well, I don't yeah. usually open Discord unless uh, someone invites me on somewhere. But but yeah, definitely. Uh, thanks for the uh, the warm welcome, guys. Uh, you're welcome. All right, man. I will catch you later. <laughs>